fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a haughty high of silver, the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion, Toto, the daring and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. Hail, Silver. Away! Get on your way. Get on your way. Get on your way with Wheaties. The road to success doesn't seem so rocky, does it, knowing that champions are made, not born. Take the life story of Bob Lemon, ace pitcher for the Cleveland Indians. Bob played infield at Wilson High. That's where he got his batting eye. He worked instead of merely wishing. To be a champ was Bob's ambition. So he chose Wheaties for top condition. A pitcher now, Bob's made his mark. He still relies on Wheaties' spark. Bob Lemon, a Wheaties regular now for 19 years. A long time to be storing up whole wheat power. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Burn it in, Bob. Keep them swinging. Hey, hey, hey. He's on his way. On his way. He's on his way. On his way. Get on your way with Wheaties. Because champions are made, not born. Yes, sir. Get on your way. Get on your way. Get on your way with Wheaties. Breakfast of champions. Bob Wilson and his troop of actors had been in gunsight for two days, arranging to stage Uncle Tom's cabin in the local opera house. But Hub and an actor named Eddie Clyde were also planning to rob the bank. A second-floor storeroom in the opera house overlooked the flat roof of the one-story bank. By climbing out the opera house window, Eddie walked across the roof of the general store to the freshly tarred roof of the bank. There, he weakened the lock on the skylight hatch. He returned to the opera house... And as he climbed through the window to re-enter the storeroom, his booted foot came down hard on the paw of a bloodhound named... <laughs> the pain of the injury brought a sharp snarl from the ordinarily gentle dog. Instinctively, he went for the man who had hurt him. His jaw closed on Eddie's boot. Take it easy, Eddie. Back there go. Here, back. Don't oh, kill him. I'll shoot him. Eddie, go. Back. Uh, that's better. I'll kill that dog. I'll hold it, Eddie. I'll put a bullet between his don't eyes. Throw your gun. Let go my arm. Calm down, Eddie. I paid a lot for specs. I don't care what you paid for the money. Look, he's a thoroughbred. Besides, Eddie does a mighty good job in this show. He didn't hurt you. He ruined my boat. Took it away. It's ripped. Oh, that can be fixed easily. It'll have to be. Unless you want me to do Simon Legree and carpet slippers. Oh, uh, those are the boots you wear in the show? Yeah, and there aren't any extras in the wardrobe to fit me. I'll need them in tonight's show. Well, there's a cobbler's shop across the street from the bank. Put on your carpet slippers and we'll leave both your boots there. The cobbler will stitch the seam, clean them up, then they'll be as good as new. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger had heard of bank robberies that had occurred in several western towns while Hub Wilson's troop of actors were appearing there. Suspecting that there might be a connection between Wilson and the crimes, the masked man followed the troop to gunsight. He and Toto made camp in the hills a short distance north of town. The Lone Ranger sat on a fallen log as he removed his boots. Hard usage had loosened the seams in the legs. He had known for some time that his boots needed attention. It might have been coincidence, or it might have been the guidance of fate that caused him to decide to have the boots repaired at that time. Will you take my boots to the cobbler and gunsight, Toto? Oh, me take them. But what you wear while me go to town? Oh, I wear moccasins. Oh, while you're in Gunside, try to learn as much as possible about Wilson and his troop. Ah, uh, me savvy. Easy, Scout. Easy. Get him up, Scout. Joe Spruce, the cobbler in Gunside, worked and lived in a two-story building across the street from the bank. As an ex-Confederate soldier who had fought from Manassas to Appomattox, 
Joe was not happy to see a troop of Yankee actors in gunsight. His annoyance increased when he learned that they planned to present Uncle Tom's Cabin at the Opera House. Joe blamed Mrs. Stowe's play for much of the trouble that had befallen the South, and most especially for his own post-war misfortunes. His mood was dark when Tonto reached his shop. As the Indian entered, he noticed that Joe was working on a pair of fine boots made almost exactly like those of the Lone Ranger. Joe looked up and asked, Well, Indian, what do you want? You fix boots? Well, let's see them. Uh, see them split, eh? Uh-huh. Well, doggone it, they're just like the one I'm working on for that actor, Polecat. Did he send you here with him? Oh, me. Me not no actor. These boots are friends. You fix them? Yeah, I'll fix them. Hey, are my boots ready? I told you 15 minutes ago they weren't ready. Well, I've got to have them for the show tonight. You'll have them by that time. Does it take all day to stitch a seam and polish a pair of boots? Oh, mister, I don't like actors. And I like Yankee actors even less. Now clear out of here, let me work in peace, or you'll never get your boots. Ah. If a New York cobbler talked like that, he'd be out of business. You're lucky to be in a part of the country where cobblers are so few and far between, the customers have to put up with him. Oh. Oh, him, him plenty man. If he thinks a dog gone much of New York, he should have stayed there. He's been here three times pestering me about his boots. Him in show at Opera House? Yeah. Name's Eddie Clyde. He plays the part of Simon Legree. Several hours later, Tonto rejoined the Lone Ranger in the hillside camp. The masked man unwrapped the boots, then asked, well, Tonto, where did you get these boots? At cobbler shop, where me leave them to be fixed. Well, they're not mine. They look like yours. At first glance, yes. But if you'll examine them closely, you'll see that they belong to someone else. Oh, Joe Spruce make mistake. Him give me boots belonging to actor fellow named Eddie Clyde. It's an understandable mistake. The boots are similar to mine, and they're the same size. Well, me take them back to town. Hmm. What matter? Look at the soles of these boots. Oh. Well, what's that on bottom? Traces of tar. I mean, not savvy how come I get tar on boots. While you were gone, Toto, I studied the town through binoculars. You see town from here? Yes, the top of the hill is bare of trees. There's a splendid view of town from there. I'll show you. The masked man took his binoculars from his saddlebag, then led the way to the top of the hill. There he handed the glasses to Toto and said, I look through them, Toto. You'll be able to see the main street of town. And tell me, what roof is blacker than the others? Roof of bank? Look plenty black. It's the only rooftop in town that isn't weathered. It looked like tar fresh enough to be sticky. The man who wore these boots must have been walking on the roof of the bank. And he couldn't have walked far after he left there. In fact, if he'd stepped in the street at all, there'd be dust on top of the tar. Kimasambi. Yes? Yeah? In town, we notice window and second floor opera house. Maybe fella climb out a window, walk across the roof of general store to bank. Let me have the glasses a minute, Tom, ah. please. Uh, what you look for? A skylight on the roof of the bank. Uh, you see it? Yes. You think Caddy Klein try to get into bank from roof? Yes. That would be a perfect way to commit a robbery. As soon as it's dark, we'll go to gun sight. We'll leave our horses at the edge of town. Uh, then what we do? Try to find a way to reach the roof of the bank. Kimasabi, me see deserted delivery stable at edge of town on same side of street as bank. Maybe we reach roof from there. Right, we'll try it. We'll stand guard on the rooftop tonight. If Eddie Clyde tries to enter the bank through the skylight, we'll capture him. <laughs> In town, Eddie Clyde was dressing for his role of Simon Legree. He was pulling on the Lone Ranger's boots when he noticed they were not his. Uh, Hub Wilson heard his partner mutter. Now what's eating you, Eddie? That cobbler gave me the wrong boots. What? These aren't mine. What, oh, did they fit you? Yeah, well, but then... then wear them and shut up. I'd rather have my own. If that shoemaker's lost them, I'm oh, going over there to... Nice. Eddie, the show's about to start and the house is full. Now, the marshal in the audience? I looked through the curtain a few minutes ago. The marshal and his deputies are in the front row. The banker, his wife, and his whole office staff are in the second row. Good. <laughs> Pulling that robbery will be a cinch. Who's it? Who's it? Who's it? 
Mother. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger and Tonto had reached the deserted livery stable at the edge of town. Leaving Scout and Silver at the side of the building, they went inside. There, skylight. Good. We'll go through it to the roof. Though the buildings were of uneven heights, all except the opera house on that side of the street were one story high. After going through the stable skylight, it was an easy matter for the Lone Ranger and Tonto to move from one roof to the other. As they approached the bank, the masked man commented, The town's unusually quiet, Tonto. Uh, we think everyone in town go to opera house. See show. The theater was crowded. Only a few townspeople had not gone to the show. These included Joe Spruce and his friend Hank McCurtain, the blacksmith. Hank was also a Confederate veteran. The two men sat on the veranda that extended along the second floor front of the building that housed Joe's shop and living quarters. In the bright moonlight, they sat with their chairs tilted against the wall and their pipes full of fragrant tobacco, watching the crowd enter the opera house. A short time after the box office closed and the play started, Joe exclaimed, Hank, look. Uh, look at the roof of the bank. Hey, there's two fellas over there. Yeah, and they're examining the skylight on top of the bank. Dog, go to Joe, you're right. Maybe they plan to force the lock on the hatch of the skylight. That'd be a slick way to rob the bank. Good thing we spotted them. You all better go to the opera house, Hank. Get Marshal Barber and tell him what's afoot. Yeah, but well, I'm going. Those two might get away. Not on your life. I'll watch them close. If they make a move, I'll let them have it. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. If you ever have the chance to see Ben Hogan play golf, man, grab it. You'll see a real Wheaties champion in action. You know, in my work, I'm sports announcer Mel Allen. I've seen Ben play plenty of times. And each time, the little guy proves to me all over again, champions are made, not born. Ben's won about every title in golf, but he still practices hours every day. Of course, that figures if you know Ben's story. Way back when he was a caddy, he found the only edge he had over bigger, stronger fellows was a willingness to practice harder and knowledge that strengthening foods would help him make the most of that practice. Ben Hogan chooses Wheaties. Been eating them for years and years. Ben sold on Wheaties for energy and nourishment. And here's where that energy comes from. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Yes, whether you're big or small, remember Ben Hogan's caddy to champion formula. Champions are made, not born. Get on your way with Wheaties, breakfast of champions. to continue. A few moments after the Lone Ranger and Tonto took a position behind the wide chimney on the roof of the bank, the window of the opera house storeroom opened. Wasabi. Yes, I hear it, Tonto. Peering around the side of the sheltering chimney, they saw the moonlit figure of Hub Wilson as he climbed from the opera house window. A moment later, Eddie Clyde climbed out the window to join his friend. From the second floor balcony of the building across the street from the bank, Joe Spruce watched the Lone Ranger and Tonto so intently that he didn't notice Hub and Eddie. When the masked man reached for his guns, Joe fired a warning shot. What? I'll see you two over there! Tonto, who's that? Him, Joe Spruce. Him on Verland across the street. Yes, I see him. There's a lighted window at his back. An old gun on us. You and your partner come down on that roof your hands up! Hub and Eddie stood beside the window of the opera house, scarcely daring to move. They didn't know that the masked man and Tonto were on the far side of the bank chimney, so they assumed that Joe Spruce was talking to them. You two don't raise your hands, or I'll throw your heads off. Eddie reached for his gun. Hub hissed a warning. Don't be a fool, Eddie. He'll open fire. Not if I get him first. But listen, would you rather stand here and wait for the law to come for us? No, that, that will happen unless I shoot. Get ready to go back through the window as soon as I fire. No, 
Eddie's bullet struck Joe in the shoulder. The impact knocked the ex-soldier down as he fell to the veranda floor. Hub shouted... You got him, Eddie. Stop your gun. What? It's a masked man in a red skin. I'll get him. A silver bullet struck Eddie's arm an instant before he triggered his gun. His shot went wild. I'm getting out of here. Throwing caution to the wind, Hub turned and vaulted over the windowsill to the safety of the opera house. Inside, he looked back for his partner. Then he realized that the masked man could not see him in the darkened storeroom. Now, I'll cover, Eddie. Pick up your gun. Come inside. Don't try it. This is for you, mister. Hub triggered his gun, forcing the Lone Ranger and Tonto to the shelter of the brick chimney. A moment later, Eddie was back in the opera house. Marshal Barber, his deputies, and Hank McCurtain were on their way up the stairs to the second floor storeroom in the opera house when they met Hub and Eddie. Where are you two coming from? Why, uh, we, we went up to the storeroom, Marshal, to investigate the shots we heard. Who shot you? A masked man. He was up on the roof of the bank. That's right, Marshal. You and I saw him there. Well, what are we waiting for? While we stand here palaver and you'll get away. <laughs> The marshal and his deputies reached the storeroom window in time to see the Lone Ranger and Tonto disappear from the stable roof at the far end of town. Hey, they have horses waiting for them. They'll be on their way out of town before we reach the livery stable. That's right, Hank. And it'll be slow work following their tracks. Uh, you needn't follow their tracks, Marshal. What? How's that? Beck will follow them for you. What, you mean that bloodhound? Yes, he's a thoroughbred and a mighty valuable dog. Yeah, that's a good idea. He'll lead you to the masked man and his pal in no time. Fine, we'll get the dog and go after those two. And I'll ride with you and your deputy. That suits me. Go! Hank McCurtain was about to join the posse when he remembered Joe Spruce. Knowing that Joe had been covering the masked man and his partner, Hank hurried to Joe's veranda to see why Joe had allowed the two crooks to escape. He found Joe on the veranda floor. Joe! He's unconscious. I'd better get Doc Morgan. Hold on, hold on. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger and Tonto drew rain at the crest of a hill a short distance north of town. Tonto, we've got to go back to town. How we do that? Law think we shoot Joe Spruce. We know Eddie Clyde planned to rob the Gunsight Bank. I'll have to prove that he shot Joe Spruce. I might also be able to find out whether or not he and his pal robbed the banks of Medicine Bend in Mountain City. Well, that's plenty hard to prove. The stolen bonds and money will be proof enough if they have them. The serial numbers are on record. Uh-huh. I... What, that? A dog. Riders come this way. Look across the valley, Tonto. Ah, uh, they're Marshal. Deputies, posse. And the bloodhound's leading them. In moonlight. It looked like Dom. Follow our trail. We'll try to outrun them. Head for town. Monsieur! Get him up, cow! The great horse Silver and Scout left the pursuing posse far behind as the Lone Ranger guided him through the moonlight to town. The evening's excitement had halted the play and emptied the theater. Eddie Clyde was alone backstage. His trunk was unlocked and opened. He was about to begin packing when he heard footsteps behind him. With his good arm, Eddie grabbed the trunk lid. What are you trying to hide? You. Surprised to see me? Uh, What are you and that Indian doing here? We came back to town to prove that you shot Joe Spruce. You can't prove I shot him. Marshal Barber's out now looking for you for that shooting. And he has a bloodhound with him. That's right. That dog will find you, mister. That's why I'm returning your boots. My boots? You're wearing mine. I'll take them. No, no. Reach for that gun and I'll break your arm. I'll give you your boots. There. There they are. Cover him, Toto, while I remove these. Uh, Trading boots won't save you, mister. I'll tell the marshal you forced me to exchange them with you. Hub Wilson will back my story. He's with the marshal now. He knows I got the wrong boots from that cobbler. You might be able to convince the marshal you're telling the truth. But you can't convince him. I shot Joe Spruce. He's already convinced of that. Man, I'll unconvince what? him. Man, what, who's Hank and I were coming out the rear door of Doc Morgan's house, but we saw you and the engine pass, mister. We followed you here. Because you thought I shot you? I knew better than that, mister. I was watching you close while you were on the roof of the bank. I'd have seen it if you all turned your gun on me. Hey, Joe, you better sit down and take it easy. Dog I you. don't care what he said. I'll not rest till that Yankee actor pays for shooting me. At that moment, Speck raced into the opera house. He stopped beside the boots on the floor at Eddie's feet. He sniffed them and bared his fangs. Get them away from me. He takes me. Call him off. Stop. Call him off. Tonto grabbed the dog's collar and held it. While the posse hurried forward with drawn guns. The Lone Ranger said, You'd better talk, Eddie. Who weakened the lock on the skylight of the bank? I did. I admit it. I admit I shot Joe Spruce. Not easy to admit. 
when Joe Spruce here to tell the truth. Who's the partner who helped you commit the bank robberies? Realizing that Eddie was about to tell all he knew, Hop Wilson reached for his shoulder holster. From the corner of his eye, the Lone Ranger saw the gesture. He whirled and fired. Oh, Hub's no. bullet struck Eddie Clyde a moment before Hub oh. felt the impact of the masked man's bullet. Oh, that's enough, gunplay. I wasn't fast enough. His bullet hit Eddie Clyde. Boy, watch Hub Wilson. Oh. Pete, you go get Doc Morgan. I, and I, Clem, you take care of that door. Oh, well, I'm going to his back. Come on. And that dirty double cross. Take it easy, Clyde, while I look at your wound. He was afraid I'd talk, and I... And I'll talk plenty now. Shut up, Eddie. To save you after you... After you shot me? Why should I? And let you spend the cash we stole? What, what cash are you talking about? The cash from the banks in Mountain City and Medicine Bend. Where is it? In my trunk. In the false bottom. Money and bonds are there. You talked us into jail! I might not live to go to jail, but you... I hope you rot there. Your wound is not as serious as you think, Eddie. Well, Doc will remove the bullet, and in a couple of weeks, you'll be well enough to stand uh, trial. Marshal, do you still want to me for shooting Joe Spruce? Mister, I saw your horse outside. I've been thinking about him and uh, your friend, Tonto. Yes? I'd like to see one of the bullets in your gun belt. Here you are, Marshal. Thanks. Joe, thanks for fixing my boots. Oh, I'm mighty sorry I made a mistake about the reason for you being on the roof of the bank. Forget it. I'm glad Eddie Clyde's bullet didn't kill you. Oh, the whole doggone Union Army couldn't kill me, mister. And I'll admit they were better shots than that polecat. Uh, what side of the fight were you on, mister? There were good men on both sides, Joe. But we're all Americans. Adios. Adios. Thanks a lot for helping the cat to these crooks. Glad we were able to help you, Marshal. Hey, Marshal, what'll I do with Spank? I'll take it, Marshal. The poor critter will be without a home if Hub Wilson's going to jail. Well, Wilson's going to jail, all right. But I'll be much obliged if you will take Speck off my hands. I'll see that he gets a good home. Hey, speaking of home, we're both going there, Joe. Doc says you'd have to rest for a couple of weeks. You're not as young as you were when we marched under General Lee. Yeah, I reckon you're right, Hank. Well, you know, if all the Yankees were like that mask man, I wouldn't mind losing that fight so much. Well, now, he didn't say he was a Yankee, Joe. Well, he didn't say he was a Southerner, either. He said he was an American, but, uh... <laughs> this bullet he gave me says more than that. Eh? It means I was right. He's the Lone Ranger. Pilot Pete can fly a jet. He's 12 years old and the fastest yet. He can loop the loop because he knows. He's got go power from Cheerios. Yes, he's got go power. There he goes. He's feeling his Cheerios. 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 Kids, every delicious spoonful of Cheerios and milk is real muscle-building food. Each spoonful contains vitamins, minerals, and proteins your body needs. Yes, the good things in a Cheerios breakfast do good things for your body. Help you have healthy nerves, good red blood, strong bones, and muscles. Cheerios, remember, is made from oats, yet needs no cooking. Eat Cheerios, the cereal shaped like little letter O's. Then you'll hear people say... He's feeling his Cheerios. a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated is created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Your announcer, Fred Foy. Lone Ranger is brought to you by General Mills every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this same time. Be sure to listen.